Hey, everybody. I'm Renee Hobbs. Welcome to the uh, Media Education Labs um, Media Club. Uh, this is the December uh, meeting, and um, Jocelyn Young and Davina are the organizers for this meeting. But today I am um, uh, modeling a lesson, and I want to get right. I, I want to get right to it right now. So. Um, so let me share it with you. When I came across this uh, this video from the New York Times opinion uh, people, I was uh, I was fascinated. I was angry. I was I was intrigued. Right? I was intrigued. And so um, I thought what I would do today is is share with you um, basically the lesson plan that the New York Times developed. Um, so, um, let me, uh, go to my slide deck. I have some slides to share with you and I'm going to, uh, send you the link to that right now. You can find this on the website, but also if you go to the chat, uh, there's the presentation and I'm going to see if I can, uh, I, I'm going to see if I can start that presentation now. Uh, it's on. It's uh, where is it? Where is it? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna share it right here. So, um, give me a thumbs up if you can see that presentation. Um, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger here. There we go. Um, yeah, so what are we gonna do today? Um, obviously, we're gonna take a look at this, um, this really cool um lesson plan developed by the New York Times Learning Network. Um, if you, those of you who are not familiar with the learning network, uh, my suggestion would be go out right after this, <laughs> right after this call and, uh, take, take a half an hour. It's a really great media literacy resource for, uh, middle school, high school and college, uh, students and teachers. Um, it's got some super cool features, uh, for media literacy, including a regular feature called what's going on in this picture, um, film club, which we're going to be looking at today, what's going on in this graph, which is uh, a very st strategic way to introduce data visualization media literacy, if that's a term, I guess it is, um, and, vis and visual literacy skills. It's got the word of the day. It's got student opinions. They publish hundreds of student articles. Um, and there's a very lively discourse happening about those articles. There are traditional lesson plans and there are contests. It's really a wonderful, it's a wonderful um, community, really. Um, and so in this session today, we're going to start with an emotional check-in. We're going to watch the film. We're going to break into small group discussion and talk about the film we're gonna take some time for reflection. And then we'll do an activity if we have time that will involve us looking at reading and responding to some of the comments about this film. That's the agenda for today. Uh, we can really start, I think, with the um with the emotional, with the emotional check-in. And that one is kind of simple. Um this weekend, I want you to think back to your weekend, your Saturday and your Sunday. Um, how much exposure did you get to the war, the Hamas-Israel war on a five-point scale, meaning five means you got a lot of exposure to it, and one means you got very little exposure to it. Put the number in the chat. <laughs> Yanti got 10 on a five-point scale. <laughs> All right. And then I'd like you to share uh, one or two adjectives that you found yourself feeling this weekend on Saturday and Sunday. So we're inviting you to share your feeling words and your and your um your numbers, your exposure level to the war. So notice that um, we have different levels of exposure uh, to this war and we have different emotional reactions. 
And I think anytime we get into a discussion on a topic like this, we want to be really aware of the way in which uh, we are processing um, this uh, experience in very different ways. Um, so I'm going to return to my I'm going to return to my slides because I want to um, view the video and then discuss it. What's interesting to note, and I think we need to discuss it after the video, I'll invite you to think about this. This video is age restricted and only available on YouTube. Well, that's not actually true. It's available on the New York Times website <laughs> as well, right? Um, and it's age restricted. And it, this is what it looks like when we, when we go there. We get a, the first warning that says this video may be appropriate, inappropriate for some users. And then we get a second warning. The following content may contain graphic or violent imagery. Now, I'll invite you, I'd like to hear from two or three people before we watch this film. We haven't watched it yet, but we clicked twice. So what are your expectations? based on that experience? Renee, who is the, is the opinion from the editorial board of the New York Times or is there, because it just says New York Times opinion. I, I don't know who the opinion is from. Great question. Barbara's, uh, Barbara's asking about who is the author and this is from the New York Times opinion video team. So yes, this is a video made by the New York Times opinion team. But my question is, what are your expectations now that you've seen the the two content warnings on this video? I'd like to hear from at least two people about what are your what are your anticipations? What do you predict or expect? Well, might... well I, I anticipate maybe uh, to offer us through those videos who are restricted for younger, I suppose. Uh, in 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 uh, some way to pick a site. Aha! Very nice. Given the title, that makes perfect sense. Thank you for sharing. What other predictions or anticipations do you have before you view this video? I would think that there would be a reporter that's on the ground in Gaza. Now, if they're going to be balanced, since it says pick a side, that I would think they'd have someone on the Israeli side, maybe with the IDF. They're also going to show you, and I would think if they could interview people who have lost their homes in Gaza um, and experience certain violence, and maybe doctors in so Barbara had Barbara has a lot of expectations about mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Lynn, talk to me about what expectations you have based on those content warnings. Uh, suffering women and children on either side. Okay. Wow. All right. Uh, give me a thumbs up. If you're ready to watch this video, we're going to watch this video. Then we're going to break into small groups and talk about it. Let's get started. I want to make sure I'm sharing my sound and optimizing for video. I understand and wish to proceed. If you're a human being and you're not outraged by this. That is a serious problem. Where is your humanity? You're gonna have to pick a side. There's no equivocating this. And your silence is deafening. You gotta pick a side. You better pick a I side. I don't know how you can sit there and say, I don't support either side. What's your opinion on the war in the Middle East? I'm afraid I'm gonna have to insist on an answer. There are wars raging all across our small planet, but today you're only required to take a stance on one. I stand with and I am praying for Israel. I have and always will fully support Palestine. Your silence isn't just suspicious. Hmm, what should I do with my silent, fake, woke, liberal, non-Jewish friends? It aids the enemy. Your silence has been very clear about where you stand. The kid from Stranger Things says, stand with Israel? or you stand with terrorism. Don't know your way around the nuance of this conflict? You can take your cues from noted Middle East experts, Kim Kardashian, LeBron James, The Rock, Justin Bieber, Amari Stoudemire. For all y'all Black Lives Matter who ain't saying nothing, you. 
Don't take your marching orders from celebrities? How about corporations? American Eagle changed their Times Square billboard to the Israeli flag. The NFL, AccuWeather, Volkswagen, Barry's Boot Camp. The Mets stand with Israel. Go to their Instagram page, go to any public statement if they have social media, see what they did for the black community, see what they did for the Asian community. Show them proof of what they did for other communities and demand they do this for Jews. Compassion for humanity is a good thing. So what about the more than 300,000 people who've died in Nigeria? The roughly 60,000 who've disappeared what in What does Mexico? The Rock think about the Rohingya? What is Justin Bieber doing to solve the crisis in Yemen? Where do the Mets stand on the war in Congo? And when you do pick a side, be sure to use the right words. Blame Israelis, but don't be anti-Semitic. You're perpetuating anti-Semitism in this country. Blame Palestinians, but don't be a... Ooh, sorry. Islamophobic. I'm just going to assume that you're Islamophobic. Join the right side of history. Correct side of history? Change your avatar. It's easy. Easy thing. And harmless. It is just so simple. Keep it simple. Infographics, memes, explainers. Educate you. Three minute version. Girl explainers. Buckle up, girly pops. We're talking about Israel and Palestine. And picking a side is also a great time to promote yourself. This is a day in my life where I wore additional. Well, most of the time. I realized that my usual formula of bimbo comedy was probably not the most appropriate for this time. This is a war with enormous suffering. Stop trying to play the victim. Anybody who is supporting Israel is not somebody that I want to be around. The conflict is confusing and unutterably sad. Bullying by the thought police only makes things worse. Law firms have already pulled job offers from students who criticized Israel. Reports of anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S. have spiked. A Palestinian-American boy stabbed along with his mother in their home. You should be raped and dragged through the streets in front of your kids. You Jew haters, you. Social media is where nuance goes to die. Israel's mother. Stay out of there. <laughs> and when it dies, we all risk losing sight of what really matters. Whoa. All right. I'm now going to introduce you to the um, to the questions that I'm hoping that we can use in our small group discussion. These are really a jumping off point, but there's something really powerful about following a protocol and using a structured set of questions uh, for discussion of controversial issues um, that can be exceptionally important, right? Um, so let me just take you to. Uh, Mene, you mute you. yourself. Mene, we don't hear you. Oh, sorry about that. I, I, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Here are the small group questions for your group to ponder and sh weigh in on. What moments in the film stood out for you? Why? Were there any surprises? Anything that challenged what you know or thought you knew? What messages, emotions, or ideas will you take away from this film? Why? What questions do you still have? What connections can you make between this film and your own life or experience? Why? Does this film remind you of anything else you've read or seen? Now, I invite you, if, if you have the opportunity, to make a screenshot of these questions, because that'll be really helpful in the small group discussion. So take a minute right now, make a screenshot. Is there an option for you to put them in the chat? I'm going to put them in the chat too, Yanti. Because then it stays, yeah. even if we go to the breakout rooms. Yep, I'm going to put them in the chat right now. So let me just uh, do that. Hold on for a sec. Here they are in the chat. Uh, 
There we go. Give me a thumbs up if you understand this question. We want, really would like to give everybody in the room a chance um, to uh, weigh in on this discussion. We're gonna take about 15 minutes. So um, let's see here. I'm looking for about five people in a room. Remember, you have to introduce yourselves before you get started because um, we're having a small group conversation. So um, there we go. Have a great conversation. We'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Okay, thank you so much for coming back. I hope you had a good discussion. Uh, we always take some minutes to do some reflection and synthesis. This is that time now. What were some key ideas that came up in your small group discussion that were most meaningful to you? I'd like to hear from three people. Who wants to go first? You can raise Renee, your hand. In our, oh, Renee, yeah. In, our, yeah. in our group, you know, we were like a little, uh, you know, uh, uh, we were rather critical of the, the video. You know, one of the questions which, you know, uh, the members raised was, what was the idea behind, what was the objective behind making such a video? And, uh, 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 you know, some of us found that, you know, uh, the, the insertions of the clippings, which showed a little hate speech and, you know, somebody uh, saying that, you know, somebody needs to be raped and dragged on the streets. Those kind of been, you know, may have been held back and uh, they were a little crude. We also, thank you for sharing. We also talked a little bit about our um, wondering about why the New York Times opinion folks were so intent on demonizing these influencers, right? We wondered about that. We wondered about the kind of hierarchies that were suggested um, that these, these folks were doing something wrong with their outrage. Other uh, ideas that came forward that you want to share? Uh, I, I just Anna, want to, uh, Jeffrey, Barbara. I was just going to add to what Horenda has said that the importance of history, when we're not thinking, understanding the conflict within the, the context of history that seems to be totally left out. Therefore, this very surface video. Right. Great observation. And the pressure to pick a side only uh, limits our ability to understand context. What were some ideas that came up in your small group discussion that were meaningful to you? I'll tell you something that we uh, discussed briefly in our group that I think relates well to media literacy, and that is that the medium itself sort of shapes the kind of message we get here. And that being like the uh, the arrangement of the clips that were put into the piece, the speed at which the cut of the clips came at us, the kinds of, of images we saw, when those images came in and so on. And it speaks to sort of like this internet-based discourse of the conflict. Like what comes out of that? We may get, we get those statements from people that say things like you should be, be dragged through the streets and rape, all that kind of stuff in this sort of context. So I, I think that brings a lot to the discussion of this video. Thanks for sharing. Part of the democratization of knowledge that the internet uh, enables is this full range of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Jeff, I saw your hand raised. Yeah, so I was just gonna say that uh, watching that and thinking about it uh, reminded me of a book that I read not too long ago, Against Empathy. Uh, the subtitle of it, let me see the subtitle, hang on one sec, was The Case for Rational Compassion. And Who's the book the is essentially, the book is basically about um, how empathy as defined by the author is identification with others in our group. And it tends to fan this kind of uh, group identity and hatred toward others. Whereas compassion was a more universal uh, taking into account the human condition. And it seemed like these, uh, you know, the social media definitely tunes for outrage and feeds people, you know, it's like an outrage feedback loop. So that definitely seems to, you know, you could say it supports empathy, but in this very limited kind of way rather than more universal compassion. Thanks for sharing. I'm intrigued by that distinction between empathy and compassion. 
other perspectives that you'd like to uh, bring into this equation? What were some topics that came up in your small group that were noteworthy to you? Our group talked about the limitation of um, the medium, basically comparing social media with broadcast journalism and the uh, lack of representation, overrepresentation, misrepresentations, and how the medium itself make it very difficult uh, to understand the nuance of what really is happening there and how it impact not just our media consumption, but our like uh, interpersonal relationships uh, in the pick a side, pick a side world we're living in. Thank you. Who's next? I can share what we talked about. Um, among other things, that this uh, film can be used in the classroom to educate students about the pressure of the medium. Because mm -hmm. when all the hate uh, videos are together, you can demonstrate uh, that triggering content and negativity bias is uh, something that can uh, start driving human behavior. And that will help students to see mm, what they're getting into. Mm -hmm. I love that idea. One thing I thought about um, as I explore TikTok on this topic is mm -hmm. examples of the opposite claims that this filmmaker makes. Examples of how some TikToks have space for nuance, <laughs> mm -hmm. have attempts at complexity. Um, and so I, I wonder, uh, if I asked my students to uh, show me that this film wasn't uh, didn't have the whole story, I wonder what they might find. Yeah. Donna, what happened in your room? What 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 key ideas uh, can you bring to the large group here? Renee, I have had a very weird morning. A yard <laughs> people came. I've been in and out. I saw part of the video. I was in part of my room. I'm sorry. I'm just no worried. worries. No worries. No worries. Yeah. The floor is I, open. I had a thought. Um, if you put this in a larger context, um, fear drives us to act and with a need for control and certainty. We put everything into binary categories, we create an adversarial mentality, and blame and anger give us a sense of agency. So it's it's this all this is just a natural reaction to all of this fear that we're continually bombarded by without putting it into context. And and what's missing in fear is curiosity. And curiosity mm -hmm. requires that we take a step back and slow down. And if there's not an absolute immediate crisis right now, we can transform fear into curiosity, care, concern. And, mm. and make a different picture of it. Love that, love that. Hey, so listen, here's a question. Would you use this film with your students? Why or why not? Or how would you use this film with your students? Any thoughts about that? I would use that film with my students and uh, well, it, it will be open. Uh, mostly open question, pretty much alike those you offered. Obviously not a binary, yes or not, but uh, why, what, uh, the reason of, and uh, so on. I think it is good as a, as a tool and maybe just to show like uh, uh, what is like when media uh, take the power, so much power to uh, design our life our opinion, well, even the, the simple uh, uh, fact that, that we are human and that we are looking something completely unhuman in an unhuman way. Thank you for sharing. Would you use this film with your students? Why or why not? I see Lynn's hand is raised. Um, so I would use this as one of two or three films. I think it presents one point of view, black and white, it sort of screams at you to take aside no nuance and have the kids learn and discover and explore that. The other film I might show, there are 150 
Israeli and Palestinian organizations that are working together for peace. That's another film I would show them. So you could show them how different media can manipulate them. But there, this is one side. There are many, many other sides. And there are peace-loving sides. So I would want them to discover that on both sides, there are people. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Luke. Yeah, I, you know, so as you know, Renee, my students can rage in, aim, rage, range in age. That's hard to say really widely, um, hugely widely. So I think it's a useful reminder for all of us that just as the people at the New York Times use their editorial power, we get to do the same thing. So I'm a pretty relentless editor of things that I share with students. And I, I pick the parts that I think are going to fit with the questions we need to address or where the, I think the students can access something. If you show the wrong piece, to a 12 year old, then they're only going to notice that one thing that's their brain's going to be taken over by that one stimulus and the conversation doesn't go anywhere. So yeah, I would use pieces of this um, carefully selected to, to do jobs that would lead to certain kinds of conversations. Thanks for sharing. Other perspectives? Would you use this film with your students? Why or why not? Or how would you use it? So in my, I have, um, Palestinian and not Israeli, but Jewish uh, students in my class. So bringing this kind of thing without any preparation, it's like, you know, gonna end my class or my position most likely. So um, so I might do uh, more analysis, but with preparation before that. So laying the ground, talking, um, um, what Lynn suggested is something that I would show ahead to like diversify. So they're not coming with their own bias into it and then ready to kind of fight into the discussion, but break the stereotype in the beginning so that once they see that, they have the understanding that this video is like, like working on extremism that is happening now with the, the media. So I would put a lot of preparation and put it at the end in kind of like, okay, so now that they emotionally and cognitively are into it and with a better understanding, how would they digest or, or analyze it? Yeah, yeah, this is a really good point. And, and even in our discussion, uh, we can talk about the conflict, the war, or we can talk about the media representations of the conflict of the war. And those two things kind of blur together, right? They blur together as they inevitably will, but they are distinct topics and areas of inquiry. All right, thank you so much for sharing. I now wanna just turn uh, my attention, oh, I turn your attention over to the last part of this beautiful lesson plan that the New York Times has created. They asked students to answer this question and then they published some of the student work. The question was, when emotionally charged issues make headlines, do you feel the need to make your opinion known publicly? Do you ever feel pressure to post about your outrage online? And the um, student who responded, uh, oh no, this is actually the, this is, a, this is the reporter at the New York Times Learning Network. She's invited students to complete a writing assignment, right? Um, and she's given them some examples of other how other writers have responded to that question. And then she's invited students to read that article and explore one or more of these questions. Uh, have you ever felt uh, pressured to post your, re uh, your reaction online? Um, uh, have you, uh, if you don't feel pressure, uh, do your peers feel pressure? What are your thoughts about the author's argument? Do you agree that not everyone has to share their outrage publicly? <laughs> How do you feel about celebrities who share their outrage publicly? And think of a time when you did choose to take a stand. How did you make that decision and why? And notice 103 students from, I say it, Luke, mostly private schools. <laughs> mostly private and independent schools from all over the country react. And 
these are absolutely fascinating um, reactions from teenagers, right? And young adults. And so one of the things that's really great is the New York Times gives us some ways to talk back to these, talk back to these teenagers like Riley Richards from Miami, Florida, right? Um, so we can reply to her or we can recommend her post and, or we can share it even. But I like the idea of creating an opportunity to practice giving the kind of warm feedback, right? And I'm doing it right now. I liked your point about, um, about how speaking up on behalf of innocent people is important. So in some ways, there's this um, opportunity in this lesson plan to kind of thread the needle, right? Back to this idea about making strategic decisions about how you participate in public discourse, because this film maybe itself lacks some nuance <laughs> in the way it treats social media. Um, and I suspect that teenagers would have a lot to say about the ways in which that they can resist the pressures of the outrage culture um, in their in their in their daily lives. Now, the floor is open for your uh, suggestions or comments. If you're of teaching about the Israel uh, Hamas war now, if this topic has come up or you found resources that you think we should know about. I welcome you to place them in the chat because we're trying to uh, create a community where everyone learns from everyone. And um, your contributions here would be most appreciative. And then I'm also gonna take you on a tour of the New York Times Learning Network just because it's awesome, right? And if I haven't convinced you to use the film, maybe you will, maybe you won't. I do invite you to go to the New York Times Learning Network and I'm putting that link in the chat right here. It's really a magnificent resource. Um, and um, Film Club is terrific, but so is what's going on in this picture, right? Um, Film Club's discussion right this week is about um, the dangers of uh, the brain injuries resulting from playing football. Questions teenagers love, like would you make your pet live longer if you could? Uh, and of course they have some student contests, right? So student contests are super important. And that brings me to my final little piece of persuasion here in, um, January, the Media Education Lab's Courageous Rhode Island Project is launching a student media contest. The student media contest is open to middle school, high school, and college students from all around the world and from Rhode Island, right? And from New York, right? And from Texas and from California. And uh, students can win prize money including a $1,000 grand prize. We're giving away $7,000 in prizes and we're gonna amplify the voices of the uh, most impressive student work, right? Uh, we're looking for topics that help students think about the power of fostering community conversations, countering disinformation, enhancing civic participation, improving media literacy, and preventing the hate that leads to violence. And we're looking for uh, different kinds of creative work, including videos, images, audio, and writing. And the contest is gonna open on May, uh, on January 1st, 
and it's going to run through May 24th. So there might be an opportunity for you to um, engage with uh, your students in this project. And we've got all kinds of cool uh, suggestions for educators on how to do that, including a really great uh, a really a great set of curriculum materials as well. So um, Youth Voice Matters, uh, as we address the um, conflict and violence that can be so um, painful and debilitating for our ability to see possibilities for the future. Um, so thanks for thinking about this as a, a an, an opportunity to explore in the new year. And thank you for uh, being part of the um, uh, being part of the media club. Yanti, what's coming next with media club? So we have uh, Siri, I think we have here uh, Maria, right? That will um, uh, share with us in uh, March or April. And then uh, we're gonna, um, not gonna do January. We're gonna spare you January, but uh, uh, February, um, uh, we're gonna have uh, one of the chapters uh, from the book that the previous media club was uh, the edited, uh, book on uh, media literacy and research methods. So we're looking forward to have you. And we have, as usual, our webinar. And the two big events in January are the Media Ed Forum, the two-day conference that our inaugural members um, uh, have the, the access to. There are some speakers here. Uh, and um, it's only $25. And if there's any issue, you can uh, submit to uh, ask for um, a scholarship to get there. And we're starting our new revived um, uh, professional and leadership development, the Media Ed Institute at the end of January. So a lot of different things are gonna come up and you'll see in all our mailing lists. So again, thank you so much. Hey, thanks for being part of it today. Thanks for joining our discussion. Um, we'll, uh, we'll see you, oh wait, hold, hold on a minute, James. I'm not letting go until all of the dogs have been counted. <laughs> woof, woof. Um, <laughs> no, I, I was just struck by one of the things you put up there, that the student on the right-hand side, I think her name was Riley, that you pointed out. And she said that she got most of her information on the Israeli Hamas war from, from TikTok. And I really didn't think that was a, a great source, and especially in light of what... Uh, Elon Musk has been saying lately. Um, but also, I think she, what she said was true. I don't think the younger information watch the news anymore. And that's mostly older people, I guess. And I, I wonder uh, about the impact of that. If that's that a good thing, a bad thing, a neutral thing? I don't know. Yeah, me too. And I wonder, is there a way to use TikTok for education that's genu genuinely empowering? Right? Is there a way to find the nuance and complexity that is in TikTok? Is there a way to use it in a way that's deeper and more productive than just swoosh and swipe? These are all questions to put in front of our students in the new year, um, and we hope you we hope you explore uh, these questions further. Um, all right, so I'm going to let you go now uh, a little bit early, but that's okay. We'll hang around if you want to talk to us privately. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. Bye now. Thank Bye -bye. you.